Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and we're taking a look today at something I've been waiting for for quite a while. This is the New Tech Connect Spark, and what this does is it allows you to plug a camera or other HDMI device into here, and then whatever video you're putting into this box is made available over your network with super low latency. It's almost like plugging an HDMI cord into your computer, but you're able to place this somewhere else, and as long as your video capture hardware or software is on the same network, it can grab footage from it. It works over Wi-Fi, surprisingly very well over Wi-Fi, and I'll show you how all that works here later on in the video, and I've been uh, quite pleased with this so far to give you a preview of what my overall impressions are going to be on it. Now, I do want to mention in the interest of full disclosure that I paid for this with my own funds. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review and no one is reviewing this content before it is posted. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. This is a pretty simple device to use actually, surprisingly so. You just plug stuff in, turn it on, and generally my experience has been that it works. Uh, so over here you've got a 12 volt power input. It does of course come with a power adapter in the box. The cable is very short on this thing, unfortunately, so plan ahead and bring an extension cord or something if you plan to have it connected to power because the cable on this is just way too short. But if you've got a battery or something, a 12 volt battery, that uh, should work as well. You've got a USB port here. This is kind of a safety net because if you are unable to connect to it over the network, uh, there's a static IP assigned through that USB port and you can get into its web-based control panel that way. And I'll show you that control panel in a minute. You have analog audio in here and a monitor out over here. So if you don't want to grab audio from your HDMI input, uh, you can bring in analog audio and then again, monitor it out that way. HDMI goes in here. There's a loop out so you can plug in a monitor and uh, monitor what you're recording via HDMI. So that's a nice feature to have on there. Gigabit Ethernet is here, and I always recommend using Ethernet if you can, uh, just because it's more reliable than Wi-Fi might be. So in my studio environment, where I'm the only one on the Wi-Fi, it usually works pretty nicely in here, but if you are uh, looking to use this, for example, at a sporting event or something and hoping to uh, latch on to whatever Wi-Fi is available, it may not work as well at the time of the event when the uh, room is filled with people and there's other people using the Wi-Fi. So generally, Ethernet is a lot more reliable, but if you have control over the Wi-Fi, and know that you have very little interference, I think you're going to have a good experience with this. Uh, this is using the uh, NDI-HX protocol. So it is compressed video. I believe the maximum it needs is about 15 megabits per second, but the range is like 10 to 15. So it's very easy to get a decent Wi-Fi connection going with this. And I'll show you some video samples of what it looks like uh, over uh, Wi-Fi in a few minutes here. And we also have a USB port on the back here, actually two of them. And this is where you can connect external storage. So you can record uh, as this thing is working over the network. So if you are concerned about maybe losing signal in the course of a live event, it will archive everything it sees onto storage so you can edit that footage back in later. So that is a good thing. Uh, there's no reduction in quality over what it's already sending out. So generally it works pretty nicely. So you can plug in two storage devices here. Uh, you also have the option to use an SD card. And the way this thing works is that it doesn't allow you to choose yet which storage device gets the recording. So what happens here is it looks at all three devices and then whatever has the most storage is what gets the recording. And by default, it will split a large recording or a long recording up in four gigabyte chunks. You can turn that off if you have the XFAT file system formatted on the card or the drive, but it's assuming you're using FAT32, uh, which has a four gigabyte file size limit. You can adjust all of that in the control panel, and I will show you how to do that in a few minutes. But first, we're going to plug this thing in, get it booted up. I've got a camera over there. We're going to integrate it into my TriCaster so you can see how it might work in a network environment, and then we'll play around with some other stuff too. All right, so let's fire this thing up and see how it all works. We'll plug the power in first here, and then I'm also going to plug in my uh, camera, which is right behind it here. And then I'm going to switch the unit on, and it just takes a second. What I'm going to do first is have it connect via Wi-Fi. I configured the uh, control panel to find that Wi-Fi connection and automatically connect. You can see we've got a signal there now. And what I'm gonna do here is switch over to my TriCaster control panel and just show you how this works. Now I have uh, something called a TriCaster Mini, which is their uh, lowest cost option. It typically has four HDMI inputs on it, but uh, because I upgraded it to their advanced edition software, I can add an additional four inputs via NDI, which is what the Spark allows us to do. So if we go over to the control panel here and I go over to input five, I'm going to just click on uh, the little gear icon. 
I'm going to go over here to the source, and what you'll see here is New Tech Connect and Channel 1 with a little thumbnail of what is going on on my other camera through the Spark. So we're going to select that. I'm going to close this out, and now input five, as you can see here, is populated. So if I uh, preview that up here and switch to it, uh, you can see me talking to you, and the latency really isn't all that noticeable, actually. The audio is going through my TriCaster right now, and this video is coming in separately from the Spark over Wi-Fi, and I'm not seeing any real uh, synchronization issues here either. So the latency is very low on this, and as you can see, it treats a network source uh, just like a camera source. My camera settings are a little, uh, little dim at the moment, but uh, generally the video quality on this has been very good, and it tightly integrates here, as you can see, uh, into the rest of my uh, control panel on the TriCaster, just like any other input source does. Really seamless how all of this just integrates right in without having to do anything other than just telling the TriCaster to pull in that video source. It detects it automatically on the network. Some of the software you'll see here in a few minutes uh, works exactly the same way. So it really very tightly integrates your network uh, with what normally would have had to be a physical video connection before. And one of the great things that we've been doing with it here in the studio is messing around with the chroma key screen I have on the other side of the room. Now typically, in order to use my chroma key screen with the TriCaster, I used to have to roll the whole production facility uh, to the other side of the room so I could have the cables reach to uh, plug in my cameras and whatnot. Uh, now all I need is really just a network connection. I do like to uh, go with the uh, Ethernet over Wi-Fi whenever possible, and I can get that camera going with the chroma key without having to move anything, and that certainly makes the workflow a lot more efficient here and less risky for the TriCaster from being rolled across the room. Let's take a look now at the web-based control panel, and then we'll take a look at some other software options for this thing. So here is the web-based control panel, and like the rest of the product, it is pretty simple to use. You will get a video preview over here, but uh, note it's not going to be full motion. You're going to get maybe one or two frames per second, if that, but it's just a way to know that uh, video is being transmitted on your network. Uh, down below the video window, you have the recording option to start or stop recording. Again, you can set this to record automatically, but if you want manual control, uh, you log into the web control panel to do that. You can also adjust the video bandwidth. So at the high point here, it goes at 10 to 15 megabits per second. If you're having a hard time on Wi-Fi maintaining that, you can click on low here, for example, and it will, uh, in real time here, essentially, uh, switch over to a lower quality recording. So right now, this is the low quality. It looks fairly decent in my environment right now, but I think if you had a lot of fast motion or something, you might see more motion artifacts than you would at the higher quality. But if you're trying to get uh, something done for your production, this is probably a great way to uh, you know, get through it uh, without uh, getting a lot of lag or drop frames and whatnot if you can't maintain that uh, high quality connection. So uh, very easy to get in there to adjust things. You can also adjust your uh, volume output here for uh, the audio. Let's go over to administration real quick so you can see the rest of the things that you can do with this. So you can uh, go in here to change your password and update the firmware and everything else. Your recording options are here, and this is where you would uh, turn off, for example, that four gigabyte limit, but only turn it off if you know you have an XFAT formatted card. Otherwise, it will uh, give you some trouble there. Uh, you can auto start here by just selecting this. So whenever the device is turned on, it begins recording. You also have the option here to overwrite the oldest files if you happen to fill your storage up on all devices. And you also have some file management on the device as well. So I just put in my card here and I can see what files it has recorded. I can download these recordings or delete them. Uh, and of course, you can pop the card out and stick it into your computer. It, they're uh, putting them in as TS files, but these are H.264 compressed files that are at the same resolution and frame rate as the device that you plugged into the Spark. And there are a few other options in here worth noting. First is the network settings. You can uh, set it, of course, to a static IP if you wish. You also have the ability here to configure your Wi-Fi and the Wi-Fi settings here. And uh, one thing you might want to select is have it auto-connect to uh, your standard Wi-Fi. And that way, every time the device is turned on, it's available on the network. Because if you don't have it auto-connecting, uh, you'll have to get it connected to Ethernet or hook up the USB to uh, get into the control panel with it. So sometimes it's helpful just to have a, a base Wi-Fi uh, for it to connect to. And I found that if you do uh, start the device up with Ethernet plugged in first, it will favor the Ethernet, uh, so you don't really lose anything by having the uh, Wi-Fi set to auto-connect. This makes it easier to get at it, especially if your intention is to use it uh, with Wi-Fi. There's also some multicast support on here. I believe you can actually have uh, multiple things drawing video from the box at the same time. So you can monitor, for example, on an 
NDI software app uh, to monitor things and also have it going into your TriCaster or other software as well. Now I did want to show you how these tally lights work. So you can see right now they are currently off, but if I switch over to my two up view here and uh, get the uh, sparks output into the preview window here, you can see now that uh, it's lighting up green to let me know that I am going to be on deck here the next time uh, something gets a take here. So let's switch over to the spark output again and you can see now there are red lights uh, on the front of this to indicate that I am on air. When I switch off air again, those will turn back to green and then if I uh, completely remove that from preview here, as you can see, those lights go off. And video quality out of the box is pretty decent on it. I did uh, do some fast pans and zooms and whatnot uh, out in my backyard where we've got a lot of leaves and other things that might uh, introduce some compression artifacts. They're definitely there, but I think in most cases, especially if you're doing talking heads and that kind of thing, uh, you're not going to notice a lot of compression artifacts using one of these devices out in the field. It's certainly no replacement for a direct connection, but if that is not possible, I do think you're going to get a very usable quality out of here. And if you're doing live streams and that kind of thing, I don't think your audience is even going to notice uh, any kind of compression artifacts that might get uh, shown on screen. I did also try some game capture on it. Uh, so the max frame rate it can work with is 1080p at 60 frames per second. I plugged it into a, a gaming PC and ran a few games to see what the compression artifacts might look like on that. And games don't do as well. So I would not recommend this as a video game capture device. You will see a lot of compression artifacts, a lot more than what you would get with a directly wired uh, USB to HDMI uh, capture device, for example. So uh, not so great for game capture, but if you are using a regular game capture device and want to bring in uh, people on video for whatever you're streaming, I think this will do very well with your guests, just not with the main game. Now, NDI is an open standard, so this box will work with more than just the TriCaster. So what I've got on my computer screen right now, on my Windows machine, is OBS, which is a free broadcasting software that a lot of game streamers and other folks use. It's a great video switching application. And I installed a free plugin for this free software called NDI Source, and I'll put a link to it down below in the video description. So I'm just going to click on that and uh, create that source. And if I go into uh, that property screen here now, you'll see the new Tech Connect is showing up and I can just click OK here. And uh, that will now bring in uh, the NDI source into our OBS thing here with that little box. Pretty cool stuff. You can use it with open source software and then uh, do all the things that you might do uh, with OBS. Very, very flexible here because this is an open standard. And if you are using compatible software, this will work just like any other video source. It works with XSplit, I believe. Uh, OBS here, a number of other applications are adding support to it as well. And it's becoming a uh, very popular emerging standard here for bringing video into your software and hardware devices. And you can do some other crazy stuff here like using your NDI device as a webcam. They've got a piece of software for free called Virtual Input and I've mapped it to our Spark here and you can see that I've got uh, Google Hangouts here running and I can use uh, this NDI device as a webcam for Google Hangouts and other applications as well. I couldn't get it to work on Skype for some reason. They do say it is compatible with Skype, so there could just be some software issues going on on my particular laptop, but uh, generally your NDI camera can appear as a webcam in other applications. But if your application supports NDI directly, I strongly suggest going that route versus this virtual route. So that's going to do it for the new Tech Connect Spark, and it has already become an integral part of my workflow here, especially now because I can put cameras in places I couldn't put them before. Now, NDI has been around for a while, but you typically needed a computer and a capture card and a whole bunch of other stuff to get it working. Uh, now it's integrated into a single box here, and I think you might start seeing a little more green screen stuff here on the channel because I don't have to lug my entire TriCaster to the other side of the room to get everything working. And I've been very impressed by how decent the Wi-Fi connectivity is on this. I wasn't expecting to use that at all, but it's actually worked much better than I expected, although, again, I do recommend uh, the Ethernet wherever possible. And we're where I see this being really useful is for houses of worship and for schools and colleges that are looking to put cameras for their live productions in places they couldn't put them before. Uh, now you can if you can get access to the network. The bandwidth requirements here are pretty minimal. And I did not see really any uh, compression artifacts that might become an issue for most types of broadcasts. Again, you should uh, not consider this a game capturing device, but generally I think you'll have 
uh, decent remotes that will really impress your audience uh, while you're doing your live productions, either live to stream or live to disc. So great stuff there. I also found it works very well as a scaler because I've been having some issues getting my iPhones and iPads directly connected to my TriCaster Mini with HDMI. Uh, they're working fine through the Spark and I'm using this now as a scaler for things that don't always play nicely with my video hardware here. So it's solving a lot of problems for me. I am quite pleased with this thing and I think it's 500 bucks well spent. This is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters, including Gold Level supporters, the Black Eyed and Blues Music Hour podcast, Chris Allegretta, John Prawl, William Miller, and Charlie Walden. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.